Hi, this is Matt, and you're listening to Bluegrass Jam Along, the podcast for anyone and everyone who loves bluegrass. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Um, So, if you've been listening recently, you will have heard that I did an episode with Mike Marshall celebrating 20 years of the fantastic duet record he did with Chris Seeley and The Cauldron, which I love. I know a lot of you love. Um, It's become a bit of an iconic recording for mandolin players and all fans of acoustic instrumental music. Um, And that was great. It's a really interesting chat with Mike about how they recorded that. Lots of insight, lots of detail, lots of really cool stuff. Um, And that was fantastic. But I didn't want to just leave it there. Um, What I wanted to do was celebrate the influence that record has had. Because that record and a handful of others have been really influential. When I've talked to a whole bunch of bluegrass players, um, sort of acoustic musicians, instrumental players, Mike's name comes up again and again. um, uh, As somebody who's had an influence on a whole generation of people, and that's also true of Chris Thiele, such an iconic player, um, and so I wanted to chat to specifically some mandolin players and just sort of talk about when they heard that record, um, what it meant and where they were in their playing and sort of how it informed them going forwards. So I made some calls, sent some emails, and uh, I've assembled a little bunch of fantastic mandolin players um, to talk about that record. And these were such a joy to have these chats. There's It's really good fun because there's a couple of people I've chatted to before and some people I hadn't chatted to before. So you're going to hear from Daniel Patrick, um, host of the Mandolins and Beer podcast, who did a track by track sort of run through of this record with Mike a while ago. And I will put a link to that in the show notes. Do go and listen to that, too. That is great. Um, And there's some really interesting stuff in there. And I like Daniel's great. I met him at IBMA uh, first time I'd spoken to him and chatted to him about this episode because I knew it was coming and he was immediately up for it. So I've got a chat with Daniel coming first, um, followed by Jared Walker, who plays mandolin with Billy Strings, as I'm sure you all know. Um, I've interviewed Jared before, but it was great to chat to him again, another you know, another player for whom this record means a lot. So that was really cool. Um, somebody else I've interviewed before, who I also bumped into at IBMA, uh, is Tristan Scroggins. And I wanted to chat to Tristan about this record too. Um, he's really to insightful and you know fascinating to chat to so you're going to hear from Tristan you're also going to hear from Dominic Leslie who plays with Molly Tuttle's band Golden Highway also part of Hawktail and Mike Marshall's sort of very instrumental in bringing together that particular bunch of musicians I think Hawktail are a band who are very influenced by Mike but also by records like Into the Cauldron and you know, going back further, things like Uncommon Ritual. Um, it's part of that trail. So I was really interested to talk to Dominic and I haven't spoken to him before, so that was great. Um, and somebody else I haven't spoken to before is David Benedict. So it was great to chat to him about this record too. And they're all like great mandolin players that I'm a fan of and they've all got very personal experience with Into the Cauldron. And so it was just really cool. Um, there's no particular order to how I've arranged these. I put Daniel first because he's sort of talks to Mike about this record and then I think I just pretty much did them in the order that I spoke to people so you're going to hear Daniel first then Jared, Tristan, Dominic and David um, so here comes Daniel Patrick I, I absolutely remember the first time I heard Into the Cauldron. I, I just really started getting into mandolin, and I probably wouldn't even call myself a mandolin player at that point. I was just a musician who owned a mandolin and I also worked for Barnes & Noble at the time so I discovered Thiele and um, the first Nickel Creek album. And I remember I was working at Barnes and Noble the, the day this album came out. And I actually went and dug down through my boxes of oh, cool. CDs because I digitally transferred them. And, and I don't know if I was romancing it or not, but I wasn't. But it had like the slip cover that the CD came in. It was back when people still put money into packaging, you know, so the yeah. CD slips out and it's got these great liner notes and it tells you the instruments that are played and in what speaker they're in. And I just remember hearing harvest time, the first track and being, it, it was like, I was about to go on this journey. It, it hit me immediately. And, you know, I listened to the album straight through. Jeez. I, I listened to it on the way home from work and then got home and then immediately put it on an iPod and, and put, you know, gave it a closer headphone. Listen, it was a great album for headphones. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the song that really grabbed me and still grabs me to this day 
and I listened to it three times this morning, and I still get the exact same feel, um, is Stranded in Kodiak. Hmm. The mando cello and the mandolin, and just like the sparseness of it, and then as it builds up into that big crescendo during the solo where Thiele holds like a single note for, uh, you know, who knows how many bars. And I mean, I guess I could count them and figure it out, but <laughs> I never did. It was just so emotional to me. And, uh, it, it just, it, it felt like as close as a live experience as you could get in a recorded setting to me. It's an extraordinary track, isn't it? On a, on an album full of extraordinary tracks, but that, I think there's one that carries maybe the most emotional weight. Absolutely. And what I loved about it, too, is just the variety of music. I mean, it really opened me up to uh, like Desperata or uh, if I'm not I'm not sure if I'm saying that properly, but it definitely turned me into the the Shoro music that Mike started doing. Um, you know, the Bach piece I was like, oh, you can do at that time. I thought maybe I'd heard like Vivaldi, you know, the mandolin Vivaldi spring and summer. But I didn't realize like it could get as uh as intricate as Bach pieces and things. it just really opened a whole world for me that I had no idea a mandolin could even approach. Yeah. And it is that variety that makes it such a fresh lesson even now, because every track is different. Yeah. Yeah. Like Harrison, the saga of Harrison crab feathers, you know, when I, um, when I talked to Mike, we did a track by track. It was just, um, Feely. He said, I believe I'm saying this properly, but I think Feely just saw the title and was like, Oh, this is, interesting and and they i think they've just kind of played it <laughs> you know or decided to add it which is you know just the whole thing and also um what a blast you know i remember that was like the first one that i felt like oh i can play a Thiele song granted it's you know up until the the, the cross picking <laughs> at that point you know <laughs> i was like yeah i could do this you know and, and uh yeah and i think harvest time too was one of the first songs I really had it's in one of these books over here somewhere on my thing of books of stuff I tried to transcribe. But Harvest Time, I think, was the first time where I really sat down in something and really moved me so much that I wanted to get a piece of paper and 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 try and figure out like how to play this. Like it, it seemed attainable, but also magical. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because you've got on that sort of continuum of stuff, you've got Fisher's Hornpipe, which feels like it's like a reference point that most people can understand what's going on there. And, you know, even if the level it's being done at is up a few notches, it's like, and all the way through to, you know, some of the stuff that the first listen just seems like there's total wizardry going on. Absolutely. And when I put those earbuds on, I didn't realize that Fisher's Hornpipe was trading parts at certain points. And it was, it, again, it was just like, whoa, these two mandolins are like, they're playing this fast piece, bouncing it back and forth to each other, like, you know, for a few notes at a time. I was just like, what is going on? It's so amazing. And it really opened me up again. My my first um, entrance into CD was, was buying a Nickel Creek CD on accident. So I was familiar with Thiele, and I was sort of familiar with the name Mike Marshall, and then just it opened me up to buying everything I could find Mike Marshall's name on, you know, it really sent me down a rabbit hole of Mike Marshall then, which, you know, again, is, you know, you find a guy like Thiele and you're like, oh, this guy's crazy. And you find a guy like Marshall, I'm like, oh my God, this guy's incredible too. This is where, this is where, it, you know, it started, you know, realizing where Thiele's influence came from. And it was, yeah, it opened up so many doors to me uh, musically. It was amazing. Still is amazing. Yeah, and it's that, and it's the first, like just going back through Thiele's sort of discography, and it's the first thing of that kind he'd really done. He'd done not all the Wonder or Lost, like some of a band instrumental recording, but just as a duet, it's, you know, he'd gone, it's gone on to do other things since with Brad Meldow and Edgar Meyer, and, but just that's the first time I think people really heard him in that kind of context. And, and I don't know if it's because I bought the album at a really – important time of my musical growth but it, and i enjoy the meldow albums and i love the edgar meyer albums as well but i definitely find myself going back to this album of of all Thiele's duet albums and maybe even Thiele albums just in general a lot of times this one is probably 
maybe next to not all who wander or lost, you know, but it's easily up there with as many times as I've ever played an album w- with mandolin on it. I mean, it's it, it hasn't grown old or dated to me. I don't get tired of listening to it, and and I've listened to it more times than I could ever even count. And um, you know, I listened to it again today and was excited to put it on. <laughs> you know, yeah. There's always sort of more to discover in there, and there's um, I think with any like instrumental recording that is bluegrass related or adjacent or whatever. Part of the joy, it's a bit like listening to a string quartet, is hearing the melody passed around between the instruments. But when there's only two instruments, and it's been, like you say, being sort of passed back and forth like a Fisher's hornpipe, just hearing that kind of dynamic with enough space around each instrument to totally hear what both are doing, which can get a bit more lost in a full band, particularly a mandolin can get a bit, you know, or a guitar can get a bit lost. Absolutely. And it really was a great way of hearing accompaniment um, in a way you wouldn't maybe normally ex- expect two instruments of that playing. And it really opened up like you could hear people thinking about making the other person sound better by where they played a, a, an accompaniment part or a backing part that would not interfere with the statement that somebody else was making, which is, you know, I, I probably could spend more time actually listening to that portion of it as a player now in, in, in thinking more about how to make somebody else shine during their spotlight on a song. And it's really interesting that because with two instruments that have got a fairly high register and it's an identical register, like even two guitars, one of you can put a capo on, play at the fifth fret, one of you can play open, and immediately there's a textural change gone on there because you're playing different registers, different chord shapes. But with a mandolin, that keeping out of each other's way is a much more, probably required a lot more thought in the arrangement. Yeah, yeah. I mean... And again, just just two experts at the craft making each other sound better as opposed to, you know, like uh, I think a lot of times when you see like videos on YouTube of people just playing around, it's, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily ever like an intentional thing to like to one up somebody on a thing. But this album never felt like that to me. This album felt like two people trying to make a statement together as opposed to look how good I can play you know, or look how good we can play just on our solos while somebody chops behind. And, you know, that's just an amazing and just the little bit of time that they spent pre-production wise and in, in putting this album together is, is like a staggering. This album sounds like, you know, it would take people years of sitting down and being like, we want to get together and do this, but we've got to work all these complicated parts out. And, and, and that didn't seem to be the case at all in the making of this record, which again, just blows my mind. Yeah, it sounds like it was an organic sort of, like almost what should we do next sort of project where they pick a tune and go, oh, well, let's let's work out how we play that together and then we'll record it. And you mm-hmm. know, it's, it sounds like, it does sound, so just the to be able to play those tunes at all in some cases, like Desverado or whatever, get that, nail those triplets, let alone arrange them thoughtfully and leave space for improvisation and breath and, you know, all those moments. Those triplets still haunt my dreams. They, uh, you know, it is just like, I can't imagine. I mean, I, I can play a pedestrian version of that song, but if like I ever had to play it live, I'm, I, I know I would never be able to get over the mental block of knowing those triplets <laughs> were, were right around the corner every single time. It's so unbelievably uh, fast and clean. And that's the other thing is the playing on this album is so clean at the speeds of which they play that it doesn't even sound, I don't want to say difficult. I think it doesn't sound difficult until you sit down to play it because it seems so approachable and, and you can hear every note. So I think it it gives you like a, an audio illusion of like anybody can play this. And then you sit down and try to play it and you're like, Oh, I don't, I don't sound anything like that. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's, and I think it's the cleanliness and, and it's a great lesson in, you know, letting those notes ring for the last possible millisecond until you go to the next note. And, and um, yeah, it, it, it blows my mind. It is amazing. It's that um, thing of when you watch somebody do something that looks effortless, it seems, it makes you feel you could do it. So like, if I remember watching a video of Tony Rice play, Church Street Blues and that that intro that he just sort of 
there it is under his hands. And you go, oh, yeah. And then you sit down and you go, well, obviously, I can't do that because that's just insane. But it just is so flowing and so, you know, so friend, it's, this is so true. Particularly, I think, I don't know if it's something that is come to the mandolin since Chris Thiele's been around, but there's definitely that sort of cleanliness of playing is definitely a modern, a modern, they really sort of tightened up the sound people expected from a mandolin. And I, I might probably was part of that as well. But I think, you know, it, it's interesting you say that uh, because I had gone down a Mike Marshall rabbit hole about, Oh, a few months ago, I would say, I forget when it was, but I just decided I was going to listen to just a bunch of Mike Marshall stuff again. And, um, and I noticed like, I'm like, Oh man, he really was like, to me, and, and I could be incorrect. I, there might be players before this, but to me, it was like, wow, he really started pioneering this really clean, fast, fluid playing. Um, it, it, it never sterile. You know what I mean? Like it was just like, how is, how does somebody do that so clean? I mean, obviously it's practice, practice, practice. And, and, um, but it, it's definitely seems to me like going back now and, and hearing Mike older stuff like I can definitely hear where Seeley probably was really influenced I wish I could remember a few of the songs where I was like oh my gosh yeah that that uh lick is a lick that Thiele for sure sat down and learned you know and then took to wherever Thiele takes stuff I think it's interesting too because I definitely think you mentioned that you know that Thiele really did seem to take that clean playing to the next level where it was like you hear guys like Jolliffe and, you know, Jolliffe is like, you could tell he listened to Feely. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And now there, and then there's players like Ethan Satiwan who's you know, like, oh, this guy listened to Feely and Jolliffe. And, you know, and it's, and now it's some players, then you're getting now to like uh, Wyatt Ellis and even the new East Nashgrass, where it's almost like it's kind of going back a little bit now to people are like, oh, wait a yeah. minute. Because I think at a certain point, like, how fast and clean can you play before it's like, Man, I, I don't know. I really, it seems like it, it would become unmusical at a certain point if anybody took it much faster. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it seems like the speed barrier has been pushed to to as far as it can go. And now it's more like note choices, maybe. I don't know. It's, I, I've noticed like a little bit of a, a little bit of a going back a little bit, um, but there's still guys who I just heard something the other day where, again, I'm like, oh, this guy definitely listened to Thiele. He's a younger guy. It sounded incredible. I, I feel bad. I can't think of his name now. But um, it's, I guess it's all out there. Yeah. And you talk about sort of Harry Clark with East Nasgrass. And I think actually Jared Walker is another example of that. They've got, um, you know, a lot of tremolo, a lot of double stops, kind of a nod to like the slightly older styles of mandolin playing while still you know, this cleanliness and this precision in there and all of that. But there's a definite leaning in some some places back to, a, you know, an older style of mandolin playing. For sure. It, it seemed like for a while double stops almost weren't being used nearly as much as like Jared Walker and Harry Clark, like just two killer double stop players. Um, hmm. I mean, both of them are incredible. Both of them use tremolo quite a bit too. Don't rely so much on the uh, the single note sort of things, which is interesting because again, I think I suppose it's just like anything. You know, you you hear something, you go back and find something else, and you're like, oh man, I, maybe I should work on this a little bit. And yeah, I, I love what Jared and uh, and Harry are doing as well. And and obviously, two guys who I'm sure are very familiar with this album. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, it was a big, I talked to Jared, um, he'll be part of this episode and, you know, he, this, this record was a big thing for him, you know, it's, yeah. I think, I think people, people take from everywhere and you mash it all together, include a bit of you and that's, that's where your style comes from, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And it, yeah. And it's again, like this album is just like, I just look at the cover and if I feel like I'm transported back to like a very like a, just a special time in 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 my mandolin discovering life when it was also before the instant access to everything like I, I think there's something I miss about buying a CD because you you didn't go and buy usually ten at a time you know you'd maybe do that once in a while when you first started buying something but then after a while you'd get the new CD and you'd put it in your car 
and then it would stay in your car forever, you know, until you bought the next CD. And this was part of that, that era for me where, you know, like I got one thing and just listened to one thing to where now I can be listening to something. It can remind me of three things that I'll listen to, not all the way through sometimes. And it's, hmm. you know, it's great to have the immediate access to stuff, but it also is sometimes ruined the listening experience for me because I can become distracted where this was just a part of my world for, you know, however long it was until I bought the next CD I bought. And it must have been a long time because I feel like I know this thing front to back, you know. Yeah. And that's actually that. And that's really true about the experience that you talk about, the emotional um, journey of listening to Stranded in Kodiak. And that's like the sixth track on this album. And hearing that on shuffle on Spotify after you'd heard, I don't know, something entirely different and unrelated is not the same as hearing it after the first five tracks of Into the Cauldron. Absolutely. And just the way it comes in, in there, I mean, that, that might be to me just the top, one of the top three pieces of, of mandolin music and that has ever, you know, entered my, my mind. And to this day, even like to the point of where I learned some of it, but then it almost felt like, um, I, I felt like I didn't want to learn it because it just, I knew I was never going to be able to capture that song is about feeling. And there's some great, YouTube clips, I think even um, one was maybe the Wood Songs Radio Hour where they did a live performance. And I think that one is on there. But, but even when you watch them perform this, it is like, you know, playing along with the recording wasn't going to do any justice to that song. You know, I definitely learned some there's some really cool, like dissonant parts in there, too. That was like maybe the first time I really noticed, like, oh, you can play a note that, quote unquote, doesn't go with a chord, but it still strikes some sort of like. Yeah, something in your soul where you're like, whoa, what was that? <laughs> you know, you can't help but make a weird face. <laughs> like, ooh, it was, yeah, what yeah. is well, that? I think sometimes that, I think sometimes that's what Chris Thiele's doing. And I think Billy Strings does it as well. Like sometimes with the contortions and the facial expressions, they're pointing out something interesting that's going on in the music. They're sort of emphasizing this thing with a, a little twitch or a head nod or a face or whatever. And they're sort of, I don't know if it's conscious or not, but it feels like it's directing your visual attention to what your ears are hearing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And Thiele was great with that. You know, I think when you see him live, you can see that uh, it's resonating every inch of his being. <laughs> you know, he's definitely like, a, he um, looks like those things sometimes that they put out in front of car lots. I don't know if they yeah. have them, you yeah, know, where yeah. the air goes in and out like that. And it's just like, uh, he's like a vessel and, you know, and again, just the influence that Mike brings into this as well. Like, I don't know that there is a Thiele as we know him without a Mike Marshall, because I think that some of that stuff that Mike did or Grisman, I guess you could say that about any playing. But to me, this just seemed like a great pairing of two very like minded and more importantly, open minded players that mm. they were able to take any sort of outside influence and be able to find a way to bring it into the mandolin and make it work like it wasn't any sort of outside influence at all. And they both had the facility on the instrument that if one of them went in a certain direction, the other was totally capable of following. There was like, and Mike's talk, yeah. talked about it, but it's not that sense of, oh, hang on, we're in A-flat now. I'm not sure what to do. Like, they just have fluency across the fretboard. And so the they were able to take each other off in all sorts of places and not worry about that. It reminds, it reminds me of, like, when somebody's talking about something in a conversation, and then you're like, oh, you know what? That reminds me of this. And then musically, they bring up this completely – different idea that's sort of similar, but then steers the track in a completely different direction. And it just, I mean, I think, I think I was telling you about this, you know, I got to see this live too. And I think music like this can, can do one of two things. It can make you think like, Oh my gosh, I'll never be able to play like that. <laughs> and for me, I never thought, Oh, I can, I'll be able to play like that. But it definitely made me think differently of the mandolin and took me, I mean, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be having this conversation for sure if I hadn't bought this album and gone to see them play live. Because for me, that the, the combination of the two changed my musical mind 
that made it think anything is possible on the mandolin. And, you know, 20 years later, you know, here you and I are talking on, uh, and we both have podcasts that other people listen to and have really opened up crazy worlds that I think probably neither, either one of us would have expected that this style of music brought us. And, and for sure, this album and, and that live show and, and that era of this stuff had opened my mind to, to the possibilities and, and literally changed my musical world. Cool. That was Daniel. Um, great chat. I love Daniel's energy and enthusiasm and just, you know, he's interviewed so many mandolin players as well on his podcast. If you don't know mandolins and beer, do go and check it out. It's one of my favorite podcasts. Um, do go and listen to that too. Uh, next up, Jared Walker, who I interviewed uh, quite a while ago now. Um, about playing with Billy Strings and I reached out to him for this and he was immediately, yeah, great, I would love to talk about that record because it means so much. Um, and I, with most of these people, I sort of started out asking just where they'd first heard this record, if they could remember sort of that as a sort of starting off point. So they're all pretty much going to start with people telling you when they first heard Into the Cauldron and then we'll branch off from there into some other stuff. So here is my chat with Jared Walker. So when I first heard this record... I'm not exactly sure when the very first time I heard it was, but I, like so many people, had been really influenced by all the Nickel Creek stuff, which in that, at that time, that's, that was Chris's main focus, I would say. And to hear him in a, a very mandolin forward kind of way was really cool. And like the songs that that him and Mike were choosing, I wasn't quite as familiar with Mike's playing um, outside of, you know, EMD, you know, and yeah, I I just you know I was 11 years old when the record came out. It it I think it was 2003. Yeah, if that's if that's correct. Um, but I remember being at Nash Camp, which was a music camp still is, I believe, in on the outskirts of Nashville. And I remember listening to that record on, it might have even been a CD player with, uh, with some headphones, and just listening to that first track, uh, Harvest Time, over and over again. Um, I don't know. It, it was. It's a very nostalgic record for me. I also I, I was listening to it yesterday in anticipation of this interview, and I forgot how many songs I had sat down to try and learn over the years that I had forgot originated with that record for me, like Scrapple from the Apple. I, I knew their version before I had ever heard Charlie Parker. And like the the classical uh, song, it, I think it's like the Gold, Goldberg Variations or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, like they all started coming back to me. It, it seems like that record was a really wide variety of of genres and styles that I certainly hadn't been exposed to. And being a mandolin player, it was way more palatable for me to hear, to hear classical music with mandolins and mandocellos and all that stuff. I could, sometimes you hear a French horn play a G note. It doesn't register in your brain as a G note. But if you hear the instrument that you play, play a G note, it, it translates a lot easier. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I remember just sitting in that cabin, listening to that record over and over again. And just, I'm, I'm glad that you're doing this because it, gives me a reason to revisit revisit those records it is it's that you talk about the variation on it because two like two mandolins could be a record that 
gets a bit tiring pretty quickly. But the, right. the variety of like, the material, the way they play it, like just... And you get to the end, there's like 11 tracks on this record. You get to the end and you've had a huge amount of variety. And then the 10th track is What a Blast and the 11th is Shamrock Shaw, which are two of the most sort of distinct textures on the whole record. And it just keeps changing, doesn't it? It really does. I, I've, it's, it's kind of funny. I, there are so many songs on that record that I, I've revisited at different places in my life. I've played Shamrock Shore my brother Corey and I played Shamrock Shore uh, for a wedding uh, as the the bride and and groom were walking. Um, so just so many so many memories associated with that record. Um, that whole technique is not it's not easy to do the harmonics. Uh, it's it's not something it's not something for the faint of heart those harmonics but um but yeah the the recording the way that they recorded it sounds so warm which which is i mean both of those guys just have fantastic tone and sensibilities and i think that record really captured it yeah, and it is that um, and that that Shamrock Shaw. You know, I didn't realize this until fairly recently, but it was recorded in D, which makes the harmonics make total sense. But Mike mm. felt it sounded a bit bright, so slowed the tape down. So the version on the record is in C sharp. So it's oh. so, like you, so you technically can't play it the way you would hear on the record without a huge amount of you know extra fingers and things. Um, that that would he, make it, sense, yeah. He was looking for that bit of warmth. I think he just thought it sounded a bit, a bit thin. And mm. it is that that those textures and the the kind of the sound of it, the reverb and just the it's so like you're talking about listening to it in headphones, and it's such a cool record for that because it totally fills your brain, doesn't it? It does. It does. Yeah, I uh, I got out a a mandolin yesterday i was actually painting the inside of my house yesterday and and i i remember that we had this uh today and so i wanted to have it fresh in my mind and i was like oh yeah i remember this song and this song and this song the saga of harrison crab feathers which with the title alone makes for a memorable song um but i remember when I was in college jamming that song a lot with, uh, with friends, friends of mine in Murfreesboro, it, there, there are so many different connections that I have with that, that record, even the album art and everything. I always thought it was, uh, so cool. The, like the trench coat that, uh, that Thiele was wearing yeah. on, on that record. I, I always thought that that looked so cool. Um, which it's it seems very much of the time you know 2003 the it's it's funny looking looking at those things now how how it looks different to you you know over the years but it sounds different it's really cool sort of looking at it because you think back like i was looking back trying to place this in both of their timelines and like in the feely timeline so this nickel creek this side had come out and he'd done Not Holy Wanderer Lost, and then there was this, and then Deceiver, which is the record that he plays everything on. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's, again, just variety everywhere. It's none of those two records or anything like each other. No, no. And uh, and this record was, like I said, the my first real introduction to Mike Marshall's music. And... After that, I, I listened to a lot of like the, the psychographs stuff, which was a really cool super group. And, and I, I got very into Mike's playing. And this was all leading up to the Mandolin Symposium, which I went to the very first one. And I think it was 2004. 
in Santa Cruz, California. It was an amazing camp. It was all mandolin focused and the three main guys leading the charge were Grisman, Mike Marshall, and Chris Thiele, uh, which is amazing to have all those guys in one place um, talking about mandolin and all these different styles. And I, I didn't know about Choro music or, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know that there is such a vast world of mandolin related music. Um, I feel like into the cauldron was a good transition for me into other styles of music. And, uh, coincidentally, that's that mandolin camp is where I first met a lot of, a lot of my, uh, musical compatriots and, uh, current bandmate, Alex Hargraves, that's where we met was at that camp. And you, you couldn't walk a hundred yards without hearing Fisher's hornpipe. It, it was, uh, there was a gratuitous amount of Fisher's hornpipe being played that year. <laughs> everybody knew the harmonies and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it was, it was so cool. It was so cool. I, I got to sit down with, with Mike and, uh, and Thiele and, and have a lesson, uh, from both of them. And, uh, they were, and still are huge heroes and influences to me individually and collectively. Cool. That was my chat with Jared. Um, yeah, really enjoyed chance. Jared is always always good to talk to. Um, and somebody else I've spoken to before, really enjoyed getting an excuse to speak to again, is Tristan Scroggins. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a great player, a really nice guy, and just in, always insightful and interesting. Um, and so here is Tristan's take on Into the Cauldron. I had been playing for a few years, and I ended up playing in a band. Um, and I didn't have, I hadn't listened to like a lot of, stuff at that point i mean even though i'd been around my dad playing and stuff i just like hadn't really gone out and tried to find a lot of bluegrass and so they gave me like a usb drive with just like a bunch of random bluegrass on it It was a very funny band we did like a very strange mix of like um like it, classic local band like straight Del McCurry covers and um, like the Ghostbusters theme song, <laughs> that kind of thing. But um, I think I think it was on there that I, that was a lot of the music that I was exposed to. And the thing that I was really gravitated towards was Mike's first album, Gator Strut, and I burned myself a CD of that, and for years like listened to it as I was going to sleep, like sitting in bed, listening to it and like trying to figure out what was happening and, um, just being really inspired by it. Uh, and at some point, I think it was also on that, that drive there was into the cauldron. And I think it was because of Mike Marshall that I, I, I was just looking for other Mike Marshall stuff and, I started listening to this and I must have been, I don't know, 15 or something. And it, it definitely had an effect on me. A lot of it was really like over my head at the time. I didn't really understand a lot of it. Um, but the things that I did understand, like really, it was like a different level of mandolin playing that I had not really heard much of at that point. And it was always something to sort of aspire to. And there's not many sort of times before that you'd hear something like that, where both the people playing were playing a mandolin at the same time. And so you're hearing kind of that level of two different things going on at the same time, both the accompaniment and the lead playing are both like on the mandolin. Yeah. Yeah. There's been some other like mandolin, like double mandolin albums, but, like 
like Bobby Osway and Jesse McReynolds did one and um, Alan Bybee and Wayne Benson. But those are like bluegrass records that have two mandolins on them. Like these pieces are composed and arranged for two mandolins. Like it's not just two mandolin solos. It's, it's like mm. it, it, which I mean, I guess obviously Mike has a lot of experience with, but, but the musicality of both Mike and Chris created something that, yeah, you're right. They, I hadn't, I mean, I certainly hadn't heard anything quite like it. I think it's the first time I'd heard anything like this, the version of Fisher's Hornpipe that's on there where they just reached the point where they just both play melodies against each mm-hmm. other. And it's just this kind of contrapuntal. And I, you know, the idea that accompaniment could turn into that where you're both just, and it all works and it's all fine and you don't need to know what the other one's going to play. It's just an improvised interweaving of stuff. Like I never heard anything like that. First time I heard that. Yeah. It's super inspiring. I think, and you can hear it ripple out in, in the way people do stuff today. It really informs a lot of my, I have a duet that's mandolin and violin and it's, you know, two instruments with exactly the same range. So you have to get kind of creative with filling up the space and figuring out, you know, you can't just chop all the time on the mandolin. So you have to figure out other interesting things to do. And, but these guys too, the the rhythm on this record, it's really similar to like, um, I can't think of the exact name of that record, but Daryl Anger's record, like Portraits and Fiddle or something like that where it's just this like masterclass in the different kinds of rhythms that you can play using a fiddle. This is a similar kind of thing where it was just like, there was so many different textures and things that weren't just chopping. Yeah. You sort of, while you're hyper aware that it's two mandolins, you also forget completely. And it's just, you know, it's just two people playing music together. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really, you know, it's also really beautiful. I've always really loved, like, Mike's playing has always been so virtuosic, but at the same time, it's felt very grounded and, like, very beautiful. Like, there's always, like, something really musical happening. And Thiele, too, at this, like, what they do... To get it's just I don't know I don't know it's just like it's also just such a nerdy thing it's just like this super nerdy double mandolin album which as like a 15 year old mandolin nerd was pretty awesome <laughs> yeah and I, and you like presumably had heard Chris Thiele separately at this point I think so I don't know I was trying to remember because I wasn't just based, like, it, there wasn't as much of his music. Well, a part of it was that there wasn't a lot of younger people where I grew up playing bluegrass. And I feel like um, even if the people around me liked Chris's playing, it wasn't as, like, prevalent. Um, so it might have been this album that kind of got me interested more in Chris's playing um but i'm sure i had heard like nickel creek and stuff by that point i just but i hadn't really looked like gotten really into chris's playing or anything at this point and this was a really i think i trying to think like the timeline by that time i think like um, not all who wander or, or, um, had already come out and that was like a little bit too over my head at the time. Um, but hearing Chris with like these other people that I like had more, had listened to more like Mike or there's a live Mark O'Connor retrospective album. I think it's two mm, albums yeah, long yeah. and it's Chris and Brian Sutton and Byron House. Um, those were the things that kind of got me more interested in Thiele's playing. And of course, now I'm a big fan. 
And I guess it must be, um, particularly if you weren't making music with that many kind of people your age, to actually mm. hear somebody who's, I don't know how much older than you, Chris, is, but it's like less than 10 years. So having seeing somebody who feels more like your generation is presumably pretty inspiring at that point. Yeah, to some extent. I think Chris is, I guess he's not that much older than me, but he had already reached this kind of like, mythic whatever stat status i do remember i like it was with that same band i think i was just hanging out i was at telluride and i was probably like 12 or something and i would busk and telluride is great for a busking child um, because the way they have it set up the festivals down at one end of this valley and you have to park on the other end. So everybody has to walk down the one road. And um, I would make, you know, a lot of money for like a 12 year old, like sure. a couple hundred dollars. And also back when that was worth more than it is right now. And, but I was remember I was like counting my money and Thiele was sitting behind me and I just didn't know who he was. And other people later were like, that was Chris Thiele. And I was like, I don't know who that is, <laughs> but I, it was like later it, it was definitely, well, when I was in high school, um, the, what's the punch brothers put out, what's that album called? Um, who's feeling young now, hmm. which is just, a, it's just like a pop punk album. <laughs> like it's, and like at the time I didn't really listen to other music at all. And so it was like a perfect vehicle for all of my angst. Um, and so that was, I really appreciated that at the time. And, but I, I, I was really, I did really just, I, I've always really loved Mike's playing. Like I said, like I listened to that Gator Strut album so much and like going back as an adult and listening to it and listening to into the cauldron like realizing how much that informed my early learning and how much it informs my composing and choices that i make like things that i had completely forgotten that were lifted from things that i liked in these albums and you were sort of saying that some of it kind of went over your head a little bit at first was there a track that was sort of your kind of the gateway track was there something that grabbed you at first that sort of i mean i think the fisher's hornpipe is definitely because it's the most like um common one i guess out of all of those um so it was easy to hear something it's like what they teach when you're um playing in contests like mandolin or fiddle contests like if you do something that nobody's ever heard it's going to be harder to judge, but if you do something that people have heard, they can judge it against the difference. And so it was easier for me to hear that and be like, Oh, that's way better than <laughs> other versions. And certainly anything that I was trying to do. And also I had like, I remember listening to Scrapple from the Apple, which is sort of funny because like, I wasn't really into jazz at all. I think there was just like another album that had that song on it. And so those two I listened to a lot. And I still ran, to, like, the weird melody. It's not even a melody. It's just like a weird mandolin thing on what a blast is still stuck in my head. It just, like, it plays in my head constantly, Those hmm. that little chord melody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting track. Because after you've had all this sort of, a lot of quite high-octane interplay this just this sort of bunch of chords that form a melody it's just mm -hmm. sort of like a totally different sound yeah yeah i think that speaks a lot to like obviously like there's a huge swath in this album of like different sort of things that you can do with a mandolin but it's also like pretty well thought out in terms of like it there's a nice flow to it and it it paints like a, a whole picture which is nice yeah and it stands up to like i probably hadn't listened to it for a couple of years until recently and went back again to listen to it and just like how fresh it sounds and how like you know just it's so got so much energy and so much life in it yeah 
It's sort of funny. It's been 20 years, you said, it was 2003. Yeah. It's funny how, I mean, 20 years is sort of the, like, benchmark for when things start to become historical. And, you know, you can never really tell in the moment what's going to be a classic or anything. But I do, it somehow, like, it it did feel classic when, like, it must have, it can, I think I started playing the mandolin in 2004. So, like, it was pretty relatively new when I got it, but it's just, I don't know, it didn't, it feels pretty timeless in a lot of ways. Cool. And that was just in Scroggins. Um, next up, Dominic Leslie from Hawktail and from Molly Tuttle's band Golden Highway. Uh, great to chat to Dominic. I've spoken to a couple of his Hawktail bandmates before. I'm a big fan of Hawktail, uh, but I'd never spoken to Dominic. And so it was a treat to get to chat to him about this. Um, again, just, you know, so enthusiastic about this record. So kind of full of personal connection to it. Um, and another great conversation. I'm just delighted to have had the chance to have. Here's Dominic. I remember so clearly because I had just gotten a mandolin the year before and finally seen Feely play in the flesh. You know, I, I had the the first Nickel Creek record, of course, and uh, Not All Who Wander Are Lost. And those were just like completely mind blowing. It's like, who is this guy? Like, that's not even possible. What's happening here? And so I finally saw him play with nickel creek and so it's like okay wow it's not a robot it's a real human who's actually doing that and then you know seeing him play first of all was like oh my gosh that's what i want to do and then this record comes out with mike and it was so cool getting to hear feely in this context uh that's just so open hey sorry i got my dog right here um and so playful uh, with Mike and you know it's like Mike carries a lot of that vibe coming from the Grisman Quintet right that sort of like open free form approach um, there's a lot of improv going on in that music and you know Feely's always been a monster improviser but uh, I think maybe he wasn't doing as much of that at the time you know getting super deep into the writing and doing the Nickel Creek thing so it was just so cool to hear those guys come together you know it was like i was just sort of finding out about feely and then obviously already a huge mike marshall fan too all his stuff with dog and psychograph and could go on but uh it was a, a really crucial time in my development as a musician and a mandolin player and then this record comes along and it's like okay that's the thing um and i want to say was it 2003 yeah, yeah, 20 out? years ago. Okay, yeah. 20 years ago. Here we are. Um, and so, okay, 2003, 2004 was the year of the first mandolin symposium in Santa Cruz. And so that was Feely and Mike and Dog and a bunch of other great instructors were there. Uh, I could go on. But, I, you know, I heard about this and it was like, I have to go. What's it going to take? How do I go? And I, I went. My parents are super awesome. They made it all happen for me. And this is the week that I met so many of the other great young mandolin players. Um, Sarah DeRose, Jared Walker was there, uh, Rick Robertson, Bryce Milano, um, and several others. But, you know, this record, Into the Cauldron, had just come out the year before. And so we were all, you know, had our heads just totally blown off by that. I was, uh, I was 13 when the record came out. And so would have been 14 by this mandolin symposium. And so we had all been listening to this record for about a year, you know, and a lot of these tunes on the record were coming up in the jam sessions, you know, uh, most notably Fisher's Hornpipe. We would obviously play and uh, Saga of Harrison Crab Feathers, and um, we started playing on uh, Scrapple from the Apple, of course. And, you know, I still jam on those, all those tunes to this day. Um, and you and went so, on yeah, to... yeah, it was... Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, you then obviously went on to record Saga of Harrison Crab Feathers with oh, Rick. That's... 
That's right. Uh, our arrangement is a, a little different, as you yeah, may have yeah. noticed, uh, or our lack of one. Um, but yeah, that that felt pretty cool to put a little homage to those guys on our duo mandolin thing uh, with Rick there, which is uh, kind of the completely opposite end of the coin um, in terms of what a duo mandolin project could look like, you know, maybe closer to the mandolin abstractions side of the coin, if you will. Yeah, and that version of Fisher's Hornpipe, it almost feels like that record and that version of that track is like the mandolin equivalent of the version of Big Sciota that Ross Barenberg does on Skip Hop and Wobble. It just sort of redefines the tune for a whole generation, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. It's kind of in the, the same category maybe as Cuckoo's Nest from that first Nickel Creek record too. Mm. It's like, you know, all of us learned it and, and we play it pretty much note for note the way he plays it on there. Every little trill and every little ornament and triplet, you know, it's like just forever uh, embedded in the lexicon sort of. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to hear it any other way now, isn't it? Totally. Yep. And, you know, being 20 years later, uh, you, you start to forget a little bit how deep the influence is. You know, I can't remember the last time I sat down and listened to this whole record. It had been too long. Um, so thanks for the excuse. But, man, there's there's so much. I mean, there there's uh, literal lines, you know, verbatim ideas that we have all copped so much from this record. But then there's a lot of uh, bigger musical concepts I think that we all got from this record too, you know, uh, subtleties, for example, how you back someone up, you know, uh, that's something that was really striking me today upon listening was, uh, the backup that both of those guys use. And it's, it's never just locked in a role. It's always evolving. It's always complementary to what's happening. And, you know, over the course of, let's say one a part in Fisher's hornpipe, you might get a little bit of a chop. You might get a walking bass line. You might get all sorts of chord inversions up and down the neck in one a part, you know? And it's like a lot of times as bluegrass mandolin players, we feel like we're kind of stuck in this role of like, okay, we've got our chop chord and we just chop through the whole dang tune. Uh, but I think this is just such a master class and, in rhythm and backup in general. And that's just one, one element, you know, but it was really standing out to me today. And you can pick any track and that's true. Like the sort of Mando cello on, um, stranded in Kodiak or like each track has a tone. Right. It's not like if this record has an approach and it runs through the record. Each track is like a world in its own, isn't it? Absolutely. And uh, it's it's so cool. I mean, I think the title Into the Cauldron really says it all. There's kind of a little bit of everything on here. I'm not going to say everything, uh, but, you know, there's Shoro, there's Bebop, there's a fiddle tune. There's uh, super deep original tunes from both of those guys and, and collaborations on there. Uh, you know, the list goes on. There's a, a Planksty tribute on there at the end of the record that shamrock shore mm. um and so i think they are in a way showing us that you can do anything with these instruments i mean you can do anything on any instrument but you know mandolin is sort of like pigeonholed into this one corner of american music and these guys are showing you know you can do anything on these instruments. And, and I was, uh, I was thinking about that today and wondering, well, what didn't they do on there? There's a Bach piece on there for crying out loud. Um, and the one thing I thought of was there's not really any Monroe on there. Uh, nothing really like bluesy Monroe, uh, which is totally fine because Monroe is the, the talk of the party everywhere else. Yeah, you know, yeah. So I wonder if that was almost a statement of like, that's really cool, but everybody else is always talking about him. And this is, we're going to, you know, go down a completely different road here, um, which I think is a cool statement. 
And it's so funny talking to Mike about how they put the record together because, like, it sounds so. And they said, like, there's so much just out there improvisation, but so much right. like really detailed arrangement as well. And he said they basically sat right. down and they picked a tune and they arranged it and then they recorded it. And it's, he said wow. that Thiele hadn't heard Des Varada till the day they recorded it, and he learned oh, it on the day. No, no, like, you're killing me, man. And he said they'd, and they'd finish it, and then they'd go, what do you fancy doing next? And they looked through a, a, a real book and found Saga of Hagris and, Crab, Hagris and Crab Feathers and liked the name of it and thought, well, let's learn that then, you know. And they it's liked mind -blowing. the name of it. No kidding. <laughs> well, yeah, that's uh, – I had heard that about the the Saga of Harris and Crab Feathers. I didn't realize that it was just based on the name. I thought, wow, like, you know, that's an amazing ability to look at a – a score and just know that that's a good tune uh which i'm sure they can probably do at this point oh, yeah. um but that's a, a steve coon song uh an amazing pianist who i've actually seen several times in new york when i was living there uh and i only had heard his name from this album just knowing that he was the composer and uh i saw a couple times he was playing at the jazz standard um and at the Village Vanguard, and I was like, oh, S Steve Kuhn, that's that guy who wrote the saga. And so I went out a couple different times to hear him in New York, and he, of course, played the hit. And uh, so it was nice to kind of be turned on to this whole other uh, musical legacy through this recording. And it, that's sort of the thing. The two things that really, three things, I think, have really stood out in all the conversations about this record is one is the backup playing, which we just talked about. Okay, like cool. Two, two is just the variety of texture of like of everything, and the third thing right. that all the, the players have talked about is how this record set them off on so many little paths of exploration into Shura music or playing bar or jazz or just trying different textures on the mandolin. It sounds like it's just a jumping off point for so many things. Absolutely, and and another thing that was really hitting me today was the texture thing of like how do you really engage the listener with two mandolins for whatever 46 minutes and man they do a heck of a job of it uh and i i think that's a lot of what it comes down to is texture and, and great arranging too i mean it's it really just keeps you engaged every step of the way all these tunes you know i was like kind of running around doing some housework this morning but like couldn't peel my ear away because it's like you never know what they're gonna do and and yeah it's just it's so cool to hear them really stepping out uh as improvisers they're they're so daring on this record and i love hearing that from both of them uh you actually hear Thiele exclaim yeah uh twice on the album which is so cool to me and, and really just shows that they were just playing and having fun, you know, which is the way it, it should be. And you can hear that in the music because it is so musical. It doesn't really have that pristine uh, studio quality that a lot of uh, albums have uh, sort of in, in a negative way, unfortunately, I would say, you know, because it's like, Oh, we're making our album and, you know, to exclaim, say, yeah, in the middle of a take, you know, you wouldn't want to ruin a take, but it's like, oh, that was the take that went on the record. And I just love hearing that, you know? Yeah. It's, it's so good live. Enough, it's good enough for Doc Watson. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's... Exactly. Sue <laughs> and, and, and I love it. And it's that, it's got such an energy, the whole record, even Shamrock Shaw, which is quiet. Right. The whole thing from like minute one till the end, there's energy just flowing through it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, like I said, I was getting misty just listening back today. And, and uh, you know, it, it's really beautiful listening back and, and, you know, hearing just what a profound influence it's been. And uh, in another way, it's uh, it's kind of scary. It's like, man, what have I been doing with these last 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I know we've all been working hard at it and chipping away. But God, it's uh, just the the talent that's displayed on this album is just ridiculous. I, I mean, you know, hearing Mike just is such a master on there and and then his meeting with Thiele, this this young genius 
you know, is just so cool. And uh, it set us all on this path. I mean, look at us 20 years later. We're still professional mandolin players, for crying out loud, <laughs> you know, for better or worse. I wouldn't trade it for a thing, but... <laughs> It's like, wow, it it, uh, it had an effect. <laughs> well, that mandolin symposium you talk of, but Jared Walker also mentioned the mandolin de Lunel trip you all took. And, like, he, right. he reeled off the people who were on that trip and all of you playing, like, bands that I love. Do you know what I mean? It's Jake Jolliffe. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention Jolliffe, of course. One of the one of the titans was there. And, uh, yeah, I was, I guess, 17 at the time. Um, and we just were there hanging out with Mike and, you know, it was a, a cultural experience as much as a musical one. Uh, we would play for a couple hours and he'd say, all right, come on, we're going to go check out this cafe. And then this cafe, they got the best espresso over here and the best wine over here and this and this. So, and so it was like, you know, that's a, that's an easy way to get hooked for life on this whole music thing, you know? Um, I'll never forget that first morning we were there in Lunel and obviously feeling the jet lag pretty extreme. Uh, I think this was the first European trip for a lot of us. And so we're, you know, sleeping in our quarters there and we're all jet lagged and, and Mike comes bursting into the room and he throws all the blinds open and it's a beautiful sunny day in Lunel. And he says, Oh, children of the night, it's time to awake. <laughs> I'll never forget because you know he knew that we were up late jamming the night before too first night in france of course <laughs> it's fun it's just that and um, maybe that's the, what we're talking about with the just the energy on that record because you know i've spoken to mike a few times now i don't know chris at all but they just both have such like enthusiasm it seems for probably yes. everything in their lives just this like if you're going to do something grab it you know and that's what yes. this record sounds like Absolutely. Yeah, there's so much of that. You can really feel it on there. And, and that's the the energy that they really live with. You know, I've had so many like late night hangs with Mike Marshall where he finally sets down the mandolin and then he steps over to the kitchen. And then it's like, all right, what do we got here? And he just throws a meal together. You know, this Into the Cauldron theme is really real with him. Um, that same year as the Lunel festival uh, i think that was the year that i got to go stay at mike's house actually for several nights he just had yeah. me over and it was just the two of us hanging and uh you know he taught me the circle of fifths and showed me a half diminished chord and taught me autumn leaves and showed me uh you know all sorts of crazy brazilian stuff and avant-garde jazz uh, you know, but it was like there was all this music, this really heavy music stuff happening, and at the same time he was cooking, you know, making all sorts of pastas, and it's just like totally awesome. I'm half Italian, uh, and so you know we really connect on that front too. Um, but yeah, it was just uh, a really life changing experience, you know, that these moments getting to hang with Mike and Chris. You know, and, and uh, right right around the time when this album came out, so it it really left a huge mark on all of us. Yeah, Absolutely. and it's really cool to hear. I I talked to um, Paul Coat, your bandmate Paul from mm. Hawktail, obviously, and he was talking about just the this influence that Mike has had on the next generation of acoustic, particularly instrumental musicians, and just what a key role he played in right. kind of getting Hawktail together, but just sort of inspiring a, a next generation of people. Absolutely. He has been so huge in that. And uh, one of the things I love so much about Mike is just his openness to any style of music, you know, and, and he's one of the few figures who's really kind of combining all these different influences that fall under the new acoustic umbrella. You know, he's got the dog music thing, which is just so steeped in jazz and improvisation. And then obviously, you know, has done his time as just a solid bluegrass mandolin player. And, you know, he's done his time studying Shoro. He did nothing but Shoro for such a long time. But then also, you know, he's 
he's uh, he's really deep on the compositional front too, and doing all that time with Edgar Meyer, doing time I call it, <laughs> uh, <laughs> hanging with Edgar and, and you know being so deep on that front. You know, a lot of times I, I feel like I almost have to choose. Uh, man, am I gonna? go down the the composition rabbit hole even just on a day-to-day basis but then also like sort of the bigger picture um you know which which road is it going to be but then mike is a prime example of someone who does it all and and feely too Mm -hmm. obviously you know you don't have to choose uh and and they they actually inform one another the, the writing and the improv yeah, then that's a really interesting point is because this album has both like super, super tight arrangement and let's see what happens, you know. And I can only imagine what the live shows they did were like for the tour, you know, just some of the moments right. there must have been incredible. I saw a couple of those shows. Uh, I think the first one was in Denver at Swallow Hill, um, which would have been in support of this record into the cauldron. And then I saw him in Boulder again. I think it was the following year, maybe a year after when the live duets album came out, you know, and then to get to see it on stage like that live was like, Oh my gosh, like pretty much all of these versions could have gone on the album, you know, and, and a lot of them are so different. It really made you realize the, uh, the playful, nature that they were bringing to the table with that music and how improvisational it really was you know Mm. know, I was sort of joking with Mike about what the record would be like if he recorded all those 11 tracks again in the same room with the same mics and the same instruments and it'd be you know just it's sort of mind blowing isn't it oh 20 years later sign me up man (laughs) (laughs) yeah I mean it's an amazing record and I sort of feel like I kind of half hope that some people hear this and go, wow, Into the Cauldron, what's that? And there's a whole other springboard for the next lot as well, because it it shocked me really just how new and how fresh it sounded when I listened to it again for the first time in, I don't know how long, start to finish as a record, not just the odd track here and there, but I listened to it like a little journey. It totally still holds up, and and, uh, as an album, as a, a piece of art, you know, not just as mandolin geekery, which we all love, or not all of us, us mandolin players love it, but you know, I, I think it really does hold up just as a record and it happens to be a, a mandolin duets album. So, uh, I'm hoping for a reunion tour here. 20 years, man. Come on. Let's make it happen. Let's pest it until it does. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. And last up, but very much not least is David Benedict, uh, who again, I hadn't chatted to before. So this was a real treat to, um, yeah, really, really cool chat. And I think maybe this one is last because of the final thought that David leaves us with, which is just a cool one. And I'm sure it could apply to anybody else I've spoken to, but he's the one that said it. So, yeah, lovely way to end, sort of thoughtful chat. Really enjoyed talking to him. Um, here is David Benedict chatting about Into the Cauldron. I think I was maybe 14 or 15 years old, and I just started playing mandolin. I'd heard mandolin for a while before that. Um, my dad... I think I'd heard Nickel Creek on an NPR station and went to the local record store and picked up their first self-titled album. So that was uh, really my introduction into the mandolin and at the time was starting to play just in local groups. There was actually a Celtic Irish band that was kind of the house band at the church I grew up, which was uh, pretty awesome to have like an Irish band in close proximity like that. So I, I started playing fiddle tunes and folk songs with them and um, didn't really know anything about the mandolin and you know how it fit into the Irish tradition had no idea about bluegrass at all. I just had heard Nickel Creek. And I think it was at the time I was starting to get more serious about playing and realized that you could go online and buy CDs. And so I went to like the Nickel Creek website and saw like Chris Dealey had all these solo projects. I remember I ordered Deceiver, which I think mm-hmm. had maybe just come out like one of his first solo projects. And, um, and then I ordered also, um, into the cauldron, which I, I'd never heard of this guy, Mike Marshall before, you know, I was just getting into the mandolin and Chris Lee was like the only mandolin player I knew about. Um, and so I got that and remember when it came in the mail it was so special, like this colorful 
uh, package. Um, this, this guy kind of looked like Ozzy Osbourne on the front, you know, Mike Marshall and, and just hearing them play together. Like I couldn't at the time really even distinguish who was who on the mandolin, who was playing what. And, um, but I just knew, I just loved the music and it was really my introduction to the mandolin world outside of like a genre seeing that the mandolin could, uh, do all these different things and, um, cover all these different territories musically. Um, and through that really got me into all sorts of other mandolin players. Like through Mike, I ended up listening to that short trip home record, learning about Sam Bush that way. And then also learning about the David Grisman quintet through Mike and, um, yeah, it was definitely a kind of a watershed moment for me where I started to think, oh, yeah, like this mandolin thing is kind of special. I mean, it's, that's cool because it opened up. If you'd listened, if you'd just ordered Deceiver, you'd have had a totally different sense of like what was going on. But that whole thread you just mentioned of specifically instrumental music as well, because like, mm-hmm. mandolin is all over vocal bluegrass and that's how a lot of people hear it. But there's a fascinating sort of 20, 30 year history of instrumental stuff as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, that that started getting me into wanting to learn Bach in particular. Like, um, I, they have the the variations on there from Bach that I thought was so interesting. And um, the first time I ever heard a mando cello at the time, too. Um, also, hearing like kind of modern jazz on mandolins too. I um, that saga of Harrison Crab Feathers track that they do was really influential to me. I actually ended up learning that at the time and wrote like this crazy string arrangement for a senior recital I did in high school mm-hmm. of that same tune. And I, it was at the time when uh, like YouTube was just starting to become a thing. And um, my dad wanted to share a video performance of that tune and ended up like emailing the composer, Steve Kuhn, to see if it was all right with him if we posted this. And he actually replied, which is so funny. Yeah, really? he's like, yeah, that'd be great. Um, is so, that still yeah, up there? Is that, is, can I, we still go and see that? I don't know if it is. I, I'll have to ask him. But um, yeah, I, I think he maybe just dug up like an old recording of that recital and I decided not to listen to it because I knew it would be <laughs> cringe. But, um, but no, it was um, one of my favorite tracks. Really cool to hear like um, Rick Robertson and, and uh, and Dom do that one recently on that duo record that they did too. It's a great track. Yeah. And it's that, it's really interesting, isn't it? To see like the influence of that now coming out in, in other places, because there's just such a generation of young mandolin players who got that a formative time and went, Oh wow. Like there's sort of no limits and people mm-hmm. went off in all sorts of different directions from there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it was at the same time, you know, YouTube was coming around and there was those videos of Mike and Chris from, I think, a Wood Songs concert a long time ago. Those were starting to, you know, make appearances online. And as I was starting to get more into the mandolin, looking up different mandolin players, those videos popped up. And I think, and those are still some of the best and most exciting, like, mandolin performances ever. And getting to see and play hear them play this music live it was really just kind of i guess must have been right after the release of this record um and they're playing all the all the tracks from this record as well as some of the stuff that they released on that other duets record later on um and yeah unbelievable stuff it really just kind of blows your mind going back and listening to that i don't know if it gets much better than that (laughs) no and it's funny isn't it that visual element like so much pop music where there are videos for the tracks that don't really add anything to the music they're just there to keep your eyes busy while you listen to it but watching acoustic music particularly like a duet performance and seeing how the music moves backwards and forwards between the people and seeing who's playing what and watching them watching each other it like adds a whole dimension doesn't it Mm -hmm. no absolutely and i don't know it's i mean there's a bunch of great players out there now but like listening to those it's it's you know i feel like that's been kind of the peak of the mandolin in the past 100 years or so um and yeah i mean i hope they'll come come back together and do a reprise of of this record at some point or do a new record together i was sad i missed their set at winter grass a few years back when they kind of did a reunion um did has mike said anything about the uh, possible whisper of another record on the horizon no and i don't know i mean i get the sense that chris is He's been so busy with Nickel Creek this year and he's busy with Mm -hmm. everything, like every waking moment, it sounds like he's so many projects on the go at any given time. Um, Yeah, I couldn't even get time to to chat to him about this. He's got so much going on. Um, I think Mike would obviously love to. And I think there's a lot of people, because even just that duet record, the live one you talked about, it's like almost entirely different material, isn't it? It's not just a live version Mm -hmm. of that record. 
there's so much. And Mike said that he recorded every show on that tour, and he also has hours and hours of outtakes from the recording of Into the Cauldron. So, I mean, who knows? Mm. There's, yeah. There's this, you know, there'd be, I'd love to hear some of the outtakes from that. Yeah, I know what you mean. That, that duets record as well, maybe off topic, but um, that one – I, I might even like even more just because of the um, like the artistry of the compositions and the arrangements on that are just so complex and just the whole aspect and ethos behind the live performance and how flawless it is is just unbelievable. But Into the Cauldron just has like so much fun energy to it. Like that's the one I definitely keep coming back to again and again. And so many different types of energy. Like the, mm-hmm. the range is just extraordinary, isn't it? It is. Yeah, honestly. Like um, all the cool techniques that they use as well. I remember, um, is it Shamrock Shore? Is that the one where they use like the false harmonics up and down the neck? Mm -hmm. Never heard anything like that before. Um, Just like kind of the, uh, like the cool chordal stuff that they do on um, Hey Ho, Ho Hey. And um, like just the, uh, yeah, uh, stuff I'd never heard the mandolin do before. And I haven't heard a whole lot since, to be honest. You know, it's like they're pushing the limits about what the mandolin could do. And was there was there a track in particular or any tracks that when you first heard it were the ones that like grabbed you or did it just hit you as an album? I'd say probably Fisher's Hornpipe, honestly. I never heard that that tune before. And you can just hear the interplay between the two uh, and that track in particular where they're just feeding off of each other and pushing each other to their limits. Um, and I mean, that's what's so cool. Like you can definitely, now listening back, I can definitely hear like Mike's character shining through and Chris's character shining through, but they're different when they're together than they are on other recordings or other CDs, you know, where they're not together. Um, there's just, just this raw energy and like, you can just tell they're having a blast doing it. Um, it comes through on the, on the recording so clearly. Um, but I, I'd say probably Fisher's Hornpipe for me. Same for me. I think it's the, when I think of that record, that's the first track I think of just, you mm-hmm. know, that, that maybe Desverada are the two that, right you know and then you dig in and you like you know i listened to it recently for the first time in a while and you realize just how much you love every track on it uh-huh. so I, I hadn't listened to it all the way through as an album for i don't know how long and it, you, you know hearing those tracks individually is great but there's something about sitting down and going through one to eleven in order just hearing the variety and the contrast and the it's just, you know it's a it's a really cool listening experience as a record absolutely do you, do you think? Do you think that because um, there's such a like a breadth and depth in the world of mandolin right now in terms of different styles, different like people playing, people who have taken different things. Do you feel like this record has been a big contributing factor to that? I would say so. Um, you know, there's. Um, I've, trying to think there's there's like been a lot of great mandolin duo records um in the past i mean now even just like thinking about some of the stuff that uh bush baldessari did and um that record he did with john reichman was so great uh, also uh um robin bullock's on that record too great mandolin player uh travelers that one was was really important for me too um all the um like the david grisman duets you know obviously with tony rice and um, skags and rice, things like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, when I think about like a mandolin duet record, this is the one that kind of comes to mind. Um, and just like I was saying, kind of showing off all the different aspects of what a mandolin can do in different genres. Uh, for, for me, like I hadn't even thought about playing Bach on the mandolin before I heard that record, or I hadn't thought about like the idea of writing tunes to play in that setting, something that, um, has really been inspiring to me as a tune writer since then, um, just seeing what's possible on these instruments. And when they're paired together with uh, two amazing players like this, um, how amazing it sounds. Um, so I, I, honestly, I, when, when you ask that question, I, nothing else is really coming to mind as far as like such a, a, a big watershed record for the mandolin community and shaping the way that the future of this instrument has panned out over the past two decades. Um, that definitely comes to mind for sure. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I honestly can't. Um, that's a great question. No, no, it's really, it's really interesting because, like that, um, 
Well, all those other records you mentioned, there's something about hearing acoustic music in a kind of duet setting where you just hear a bit more of what's going on that might get lost in a five-piece band. Um, and particularly for mandolins, you know, just to hear all the different textures of rhythm playing that are going on and all the dynamics and the things like harmonics and just, you know, all of that is so there because it's just the two of them in a room. Mm-hmm. And to be able to hear every note of what both of them does at the same time is, you know, that's that's one of the coolest things about it for me. Absolutely, yeah. I know what you mean. In a duo setting, too, there's no room to hide. Like, you really have to be both, uh, you know, a great supporting musician and a great soloist. And um, and there's something just magical when uh, the interplay between two musicians kind of feels like a dance like that, where they're, um, there's no weak leaks and they're they're both just feeding off each other and pushing each other to the, to the limits, which I think is so special. Um, and that, I think, I feel like this record is a quintessential example of that for sure in the acoustic world. Yeah. And just that, um, this is something Mike talked about when I talked to him about the record was just the ability of both of them to go wherever, like they, they recorded track by track, they'd rehearse a track, record it and then go, well, what should we do next? And they'd learn something and record it on the same day. And that, and this isn't simple music, some of it, um, mm-hmm. the, the ability to one of them go, shall we do this? Let's harmonize that. And the other one go, yeah, I can do that. And, you know, just keep pushing each other further and further. Mm-hmm. So it's like you said before, it's just so, so exciting. The energy on it is so exciting. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you get the sense that everyone's, it, it feels so off the cuff, but also so flawless at the same time. There's, um, there's kind of like a live energy to it that um, I feel like is really hard to replicate in a studio. Um, and you can feel like the the listening going on between each of the musicians too, where they're not trying to steer the song one direction too much. They're always like listening to where the other one is and responding to it saying, yes. And, you know, like, this is, this is what you're doing. I can do that too. Let me like play off this and take it to a new place. Um, yeah. It's, it's really beautiful stuff. I think like mandolin instrumental music before it hadn't really caught my ear quite as much for some reason, but yeah, like that one just kind of made me love everything about the instrument. And I, you know, probably would not be where I am today without it, to be honest. Um, Something about it just really stuck with me. And that's it. That wraps up this celebration of Into the Cauldron. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, It's just such a great record and such a cool one to chat about. Um, And I find these, episodes where I get to chat to people about other people's music super interesting because you get a different sort of take from people and they're always fun and it's a chance to chat to loads of people in one go which is you know obviously great fun to do as well Um, and it's just a record I love and I think um, like just personally speaking instrumental records I'm a big fan of a really good instrumental record and they're sometimes a little bit harder to get your head around than a vocal record that's got lyrics and you know, all of that with it and vocals. and But just this record is just listening back to it for these conversations, just still so fresh and so exciting and so full of energy. And it's been a real treat to get to listen to it again for this and to get to talk to people. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I will see you next time. Have a great week and happy picking. (laughs) 